So I'm Dontara Terrell, and I am just going to jump right into it. All right, let's go. All right, let's do it. So my first question is kind of a loaded question. Um, yes. How can you describe growing up in New Orleans, and what about your hometown do you carry with you? Well, you know, growing up in New Orleans, it was tough for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in poverty, but what I carry with me from my hometown is uh, not being afraid of the not knowing and, and character and hard work and not looking back. I think New Orleans taught me that even though I grew up in a tough place, it taught me how to be tough. It taught me how to overcome adversity and it taught me how to keep going. So when you look at Barlin Perna, you look at Hurricane Katrina, when the levers broke, a lot of people gave up. Uh, a lot of people thought that life was over, mm -hmm. but they always say the cream rise to the top. When it was over, we rose back up and we kept going. And I think that you're gonna see throughout this uh, throughout this series, how some of us popped back, uh, took advantage of a situation to where we was able to better ourselves, and some of us took it to where we didn't have the education, we didn't have the funding, had to try to figure it out. But like I said in the end, we are stronger together. Like people came together from everywhere to help uh, blacks. Asians, white, Latinos, you know, we all stood together to, to to make a difference. And I think that's what this about. That's what this whole series is about. Us overcoming adversity and and in the love for New Orleans. That 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 we now we have New Orleans people everywhere, every city, every town. And somebody from New Orleans, because of Hurricane Katrina, relocated and doing something amazing with their lives. So it is it, incredible. And, you know, speaking of Hurricane Katrina, um, yeah. looking back, what lessons can, um, well, what do you think Hurricane Katrina taught us about the meaning of racism? Yeah, you know, uh, racism is real. And um, you look at uh, what was happening in the black communities and how the white community was able to deal with uh, bouncing back. And um, I think, so it's kind of different for me because by me being from New Orleans and knowing that you have good people and bad people. So, you know, it's a racism thing that still exists in the world. But for me, I was able to meet good white people, bad white people, good black people, black, black, black people, good police, bad police. So I didn't seen it all. So uh, I, I kind of like try to touch it from the heart saying um, the bad people have to be accountable for their actions no matter what they do and the good people need to be celebrated. So yeah, we know it still exists, but we can't change the past, but we can change the future through economic empowerment. I'm tired of marching. I'm tired of doing all this stuff to show people where we are. I'm saying, you know what, how we change this, Martin Luther King, uh, all the civil rights, people fought for our civil rights, fought for freedom. We beyond that now. Now let's figure out the hate that other people still have because it's it's a small part now. It's not as large as it used to be. So that number is small. And I'm saying, how do we fight that? We fight that with love and we make them coexist to us to where it's like, you know what? We know y'all there, but guess what? We really don't see y'all. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think to me, what I'm able to see now the younger people uh, that don't want to be like they forefathers was, they 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 marching in the streets with us now. They 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 understand what we are going through, and I think that's what we able to see from Hurricane Katrina. The growth we know that is existing and it's real, but the growth to where now even they know the stuff that happened to us was wrong, and they want to fix it. So mm -hmm. I'm more proud about that moving on. Right. Okay. And switching gears, you've yes. had so many career highs, but sh but can you speak to one of your career lows and how it shaped yes. you the person you are today? Yes. I mean, my career low getting into the music business. I was an opening act for Tupac. I didn't sell many records, and I, I thought my career was over with. Mm 
And, and I want people to know that failure is what builds your character. And uh, being that opening act, coming out on the stage when the light's on and nobody's screaming for you or done that, but that don't mean that you're not going to get to your success. Uh, that failure motivated me. Uh, it's never lost. It's a lesson. I took that as a lesson. I kept pushing. I kept pushing forward. I kept believing, and I went from selling no records to over 100 million records. That just goes to show you when you work hard and you're passionate about something and you chase your dreams and your goals, anything is possible when you put your trust and faith in God and, and, and put the work in. You know, I think that's a very good point because I don't think people realize um, along your journey to success and anybody's journey, failure is yeah. much, you know, it builds wisdom. Like you said, it builds character and it's a necessary yeah. element yeah. along your journey to success. It makes you work yes. much harder and, you know, persevere. Um, yes. Yes. So, you know, artists like 2 Chains and Solange and so many people have uh, talked about how they admired you, appreciated you, and just yeah. your legacy um, throughout the years. So how would you describe your influential effect on the music industry? Well, I think uh, I was the guy that taught the music industry uh, how to know your work how to get some value out of your crap, uh, how to make money off of what you didn't sacrifice and put your time into. Um, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's what, that's what my life is, I think, to the music industry. Uh, when I first got in the music industry, a lot of African-American, even artists just wasn't making money. They was, they was good with just getting advance checks and I, I don't think they good with that. After seeing my career, they 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 want more. They 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 understand that if I do this this way, the way Master P did this, then I'm worthy of this. And I think that's what life is. Sometimes, you know, you got to learn from from the people that came before you. And I think that's what I could give to the game. I'm constantly trying to give them that knowledge and that wisdom and and that financial advice that we are more than just artists. We are more than just entertainers and athletes. Uh, be a business be a brand, uh, know your self-worth. You know, I recently um, interviewed Nikki Giovanni and she sort of told me, she was like, you're more than a writer. You have to think of yourself as a business, as a brand. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, you know, back in the early nineties, when you were first creating yeah. No Limit, what would you do differently to develop your record label and early business ventures today, looking back? Well, I mean, what I've done with the 90s, I had to do a lot of stuff, uh, street marketing. I had to actually be there. Now, uh, the only thing I could see that would change with social media, I wouldn't have to be in all these places. I wouldn't have to fly to all these places. I would just have to be hot on the internet. I would, I would have to do internet ads instead of actually putting up posters and billboards in these markets. I mean, I think other than that, I wouldn't change nothing else but being able to understand the power of technology and the internet to 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 create the hype for my business. That would be the only thing that I that I would do different. And I feel like you're doing such a great job in terms of pivoting with the times because you are utilizing yeah. your social media platform now. You know, yeah. I see your your Instagram stories, your yeah. IG files, so absolutely. Yeah. And you know, so there's been a lot of discussion around closing the racial wealth gap and a lot mm -hmm. of suggestions to do so. But in your words, what do you think collectively as a community is the key to closing the racial wealth gap? Well, it's all about economic empowerment. We, we talked about it earlier. Stop complaining and marching and let's figure out how to attain some of this wealth, to build generational wealth, to take care of the elderly, the kids in our community. It all starts through education. And I think everybody thinks it's with money. It's all with knowledge and wisdom. These people have a jump on us because they know what to do with money. They know how to get money. They they know how to go to the banks. They understand credit. It's all education. I think we need to educate our culture on financial literacy. Even when you look at HBCUs, we have to prepare the students with a better living arrangements, uh, better books, uh, better technology, computers, all these different things. It's all preparation. When you go to these other culture schools uh, that they control, they're controlling the education. They're controlling, you know, what they are learning. Uh, we need to we need to add economics and banking into our school system. 
And uh, we, we need to hold us accountable. We need to hold the teachers. We need to hold people that's putting money into the next generation, like just not giving us. I mean, when I looked at going to HBCU in my time, you know, they didn't have academicians in the school. The dormitories wasn't the best of dormitories. And I'm like, we need to focus on that because if we prepare the next generation, we're going to be okay. We're talking about building that gap and, and leveling the playing field. We talk about financial literacy. I think that's that's the page we have to be on. So, you know, I'm a proud HBCU graduate. I went to FAMU yeah. and HBCU, yeah. like blood runs deep. I have a sister. My oldest sister went to Howard Hampton. Yeah. Another one graduated from Hampton and the other one, she's a two-time HBCU graduate. She yeah. went to Texas Southern for law school and Fisk University. Um, but Personally speaking, I can speak to my experience at HBCU. I think it prepared us a great yes. deal and going out into the world and yes. you know creating our profession. Although it was a couple of hiccups along the yeah. way, but I feel but like see, we, don't, we don't we don't talk about that. And I think being uncomfortable, we we have to tell the truth, and that's how we fix it for the next generation. Do you know females graduate from HBCUs more than any other universities in the world, yes. which is incredible. And we okay, so how come, how come it's not more females from HBCUs leading these Fortune 500 companies? Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm talking about CEOs of these Fortune 500 companies. We graduate so many, but we should be at the top of the food chain in these Fortune 500 companies. If we have to change that narrative, and, but the preparation part, we don't talk about the uncomfortableness growing through an HBCU. I know that makes us so stronger because a lot of my friends, they stronger now because they came, they went through the adversity, but I'm saying we shouldn't have to go through the adversity when we get the education because we're putting leaders out into the world. And one thing, I don't, I don't know how your dormitory was at your school, but when I went to HBCUs, it wasn't the same as going to these other big universities. And I'm, I'm saying, I want to change that narrative, to be honest, which I really do. Like, I'm passionate about that, making sure we got the right books. You know, when I look at my friends that went to HBCUs, you know, a lot of them had older books. Uh, I'm just, I'm speaking from what I see. I know people <laughs> don't like to talk about it, but I'm just saying, and, and, and guess what? When we make it, we've been through so much to where we, we fighters, we strong, we like, I'm about to go out here and make it and change the world, but we shouldn't have to go through that adversity while we're going through college when other students are not going through that. That's my, that's the whole part of it because we, we graduate some greats, but my thing is how do we make this easy in, uh, you know, going through this educational process, so. Okay, okay. So, so what prompted you to begin researching like the history and just the legacy behind HBCUs, you know, to help you transition your frame of mind from owning an NBA team to now wanting to own an HBCU? Why shouldn't an NBA All-Star? When they had the All-Star game at the HBCU, I was like, this is amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Then I researched, I Googled, and that's what we could do. That's the, that's the difference, the time when I Googled who owned HBCU and who are the founders of HBCU? And I was shocked. So that was it. This one, I'm like, we had to change that narrative because we can't even control the education that we're given to our culture because we don't we don't even own it. So when you say HBCU, that's very general. So specifically, which HBCU? Because I know FAMU was founded by, uh, by, who? Uh, Thomas, by who? Tucker, Thomas Tucker by and Thomas Gibbs. Yeah. Uh huh. So. Okay. Did you see FAMU on All-Star? This is just me bragging. <laughs> yeah. So look at Spelman, look at a lot of the college, look at Howard, look, I mean, um, uh, Rockefeller wife. Mm -hmm. That's what Spelman is, was built on. That's the founder. Right, okay. And, um, and um, just stuff like that, I think that I want to, I want to, I want it to be more of us because then if, if we, if you get a lot of business people that's in this 21st century say, let me figure out how to create our own, uh, uh, be a part of a HBCU to where now 
we're making sure we have the right education, we feeding the knowledge, because it's all about information and knowledge. We feeding that to our culture. Then we're gonna be able to go even further. But a lack of information and knowledge, we stuck. And so that's when I, I, I started thinking about it and I, and I said, wow, Imagine if we could change that narrative. That's it. That, that, that was all it was. Like, what if we could change that narrative? Mm -hmm. Okay. So so when you say um, you want to own an HBCU, do you mean like yes. an existing HBCU, create an endowment to put money back into specific institutions? Um, and like all of, all of the above. All, all of the above. I, I just want to start. I want to. You know, I love HBCUs. I love our people. When you when when you see people that look like us, because I want to educate us. That's my whole thing. So I feel like if we start there, we're gonna get closer to the dreams and goals. Maybe we might not see it during our time lifetime, but be putting that light bulb on and getting closer and, and investing into this. I think that the change will start. And, and, and it, it'll, it'll put that light bulb on for more African-American business owners to say, you know what, let's invest into the next generation, education. That's basically what it is. So have you thought about, I know you speak um, a great deal about financial li literacy. Would you, yeah. like, would you be down for teaching a financial literacy class at an HBCU? Yes, I would love to do that. Oh, you should yes. do it right now. All right. All right. <laughs> Fam, all day, every day. All right. <laughs> um, so, who is your hero and why? Um, Muhammad Ali is okay. my hero. Mm -hmm. You know, my father, my grandfather, um, and and why these people are my heroes. I just start off with Muhammad Ali. I mean, he not only was a great talent, but he made a difference. He went out and fought for our people. He went out and used uh, his celebrity status to change the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, he shed that light on us and it'll never be forgotten. Same way with my dad and my grandfather for me, they paved the way for me. And so I, I love them. I, I appreciate the man they help me become and I want to help other kids across the world that probably don't even have a father. I want to be there for them like that and educate and, and be that tough love sometimes because I needed that and I want to give that to the culture. So yes, that, that, that's my hero, Muhammad Ali. Nice. Okay. And yeah. I want to go back to generational wealth really quickly because yes. I was actually just having a conversation with someone about generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And their different definition of generational wealth was extremely different from mine. Theirs was about money, which yes, is a part of it. But yes. I also think like to what you said, it's about knowledge, it's about opportunity. Yeah. So yeah. what is your definition of generational wealth? And um, what are the necessary steps for black families to not only achieve generational wealth, but maintain it? Well, for black families, you have to realize generational wealth is knowledge and wisdom. If you have the knowledge and wisdom, the money will come. And I think people have to stop praying for money and start praying for wisdom. When you when when you pray for wisdom and you you actually put the work in, you you sacrifice, you're gonna be successful. And when you educate your family, that's what generational wealth is sacrifice. A lot of a lot of families sacrifice to send their kids to school when a lot of the elderly didn't go to school because they understand that we need to prepare the next generation. And I think for me as an African-American father, generational wealth is about educating and being able to pass something down from generation to generation, whether it's a business, um, it is, you know, whether it's, it's uh, knowledge, whether it's, because uh, people don't realize information is changing every year. And so when you prepare with wisdom and knowledge, I feel like you're going to always have money. I tell people all the time, I could lose everything I have, but I have a billion dollars worth of knowledge and I'm going to get it back. And, and I think uh, we're not educating our families. And that's what generational wealth is for me. Uh, having faith and educating your family. 
And with that being said, you're an entrepreneur. You have your hand in, yeah. yes, a lot of different ventures. So how do you know when it's the right uh, business deal to make? Well, I think you know when it's the right business deal to make, it gotta be something that you love and you, it gotta be something that you knowledge it about. I think a lot of people just get into anything. If you look at everything that I'm doing, it kind of go with each other. You gotta stop playing checkers and start playing chess. It gotta be something that you love and you wanna be a part of, because if you're not gonna put your time into it, then it's it's just a it's a waste. Um uh, and, and I'm not about wasting time or money. Yeah, <laughs> that part. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then this is my last question. Um, just going back to Hurricane Katrina. Looking back, yeah. what lessons uh, can the rest of the country draw from that experience? Well, we can't say never. Uh, when you look at Hurricane Katrina, we're, we're never prepared. And we never know when a tragedy is going to strike. So we are stronger together. I think that a lot of this success is temporary. People think that they could take this money with them, but it's more about love. It's more about telling the people you love them. You never know who you're going to see or who you're not going to see after they walk out that door. So Hurricane Katrina has brought us closer the same way the pandemic has brought us closer. Learn to love the people that you have around you because you never know. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I know that lesson. Unfortunately, yeah. well, yeah, yeah, my mother passed away. So I definitely, yeah, yeah know that lesson. Well, yeah. thank you so much. This was yeah. great. Um, been a huge time yeah. trip in yours. And New Orleans is one of my favorite cities. Yeah. I'm saying I'm moving there. Thank so. you. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. Have a good one.